well welcome back to my channel for today's episode of coffee crime and crafts uh, this is Pam of Pam's crafty corner and today we're going to take a look back at a rather famous crime spree that occurred in the state of Nebraska in 1958 a crime spree that left 11 people dead and two people charged with murder this is the case of Carol Ann Fugate and Charlie Starkweather. So, um, today, instead of enjoying my favorite dark roast coffee, I'm actually drinking some uh, water today. Um, and I have pulled out the sweater that I am knitting for my sister. Um, if you remember, um, I knit a vintage um, fish pattern sweater for myself last year. And it's the same pattern that was worn by Jessica Fletcher in the series Murder, She Wrote. And... My sister asked me to do one for her. I haven't touched this since before the summer, but with sweater weather being here already, I thought I would pull this out because she's gonna soon be chasing me down for this. So I figured I better get my butt in gear and get some um, progress done on it. I've already finished the back of the sweater. I finished that earlier this week. Um, yesterday, I cast on the ribbed um, band um, for the front of the sweater. This is the first panel on the right side, which of course has the um, either zipper band or button band on this side because it will be worn on the right this way. And uh, the ribbing is all done. So now I'm going to start knitting up the body of the pattern, which I have here until I get to where I need to start the color work. So grab your beverage of choice and um, your snack of choice, get your own knitting or stitching project, and let's get started. So our story today um, is a true crime spree that occurred in 1958 in the state of Nebraska um, in the United States. The two suspects in our story are Carol Ann Fugate and Charles Starkweather, who have been compared to a more modern version of Bonnie and Clyde. Their crime spree inspired at least two Hollywood films, uh, Badlands starring Martin Sheen and Sissy Spacek, as well as Natural Born Killers starring Woody Harrelson and Juliette Lewis as well as a TV miniseries uh, called Murder in the Heartland that starred Tim Roth and Feruza Balk. I think that's how you say her name. Anyway, the story was so sensational because the main characters went on a killing spree over eight days that left 11 people dead. There was also a lot of controversy surrounding the couple due to their age difference. Uh, Charles at the time was 19 years old, but Carol Ann, she was only 14. When it was all over, they were both charged with the murders, but Carol Ann claimed that she was just a terrified teenager and not actually a willing participant. Okay, the last two stitches there. So Carol Ann um, was born July 30th, 1943. She lived in Belmont, Nebraska with her mother, Valda Bartlett, her stepfather, Marion Bartlett, and her baby sister, Betty Jean. Carol Ann met Charles Starkweather in 1956 
when she was just um, 13 and he was a high school dropout five years her senior. Charles was born on November 24th, 1938. He was the third of seven children born to Guy and Helen Starkweather. By the time he was 18, when he met Carol Ann, he had dropped out of high school and his family were afraid of him due to his violent outbursts. He worked for a while at a newspaper warehouse, which was close to Carol Ann's school, and he would visit her every day after school let out. Charlie taught Carol Ann how to drive, and at one point, she damaged another vehicle while driving Charlie's car, which was actually registered to his father. So Guy Starkweather ended up paying the damages and he fought with Charlie over the matter. He then kicked Charlie out of their home. So Charlie quit his job at the newspaper warehouse and started working as a garbage collector. Oops, last four stitches. I have to knit those for the button band. Um, so he started working as a garbage collector. He used his downtime uh, plotting bank robberies as his level of aggression and violence had been escalating. All right, that's two rows. On November 30th, um, 1957, Charlie visited a service station in Lincoln, Nebraska. He wanted to purchase a stuffed animal that he had seen in the service station for Carol Ann as a gift. And he tried to convince the clerk to sell it to him on credit. Well, the clerk, Robert Colvert, he refused to extend any credit to Charlie. And Charlie left the establishment very angry. He returned later that night with a shotgun in his car. So when he returned, he parked just up the road from the gas station and he walked into the store without the gun and purchased a pack of gum. He walked out without incident. Then a little while later, he returned, made another purchase of a small item and again walked out without incident. Then a little around 3 a.m. December 1st, so this would have been late the night of the 30th, early morning hours of actually the morning of the December 1st. So around 3 a.m. he returned to the service station again but this time he had the shotgun with him. He got angry with Robert. He forced him to open the till and stole $100. And then he forced Robert out into his car, driving him to a remote area. And once they got there, they fought over the gun. So the gun went off and Robert was shot in the knee. Charlie then shot him in the head, leaving Robert in the middle of the isolated road. And Robert's body was not found until the next day. And that's when the police began a murder investigation into his death. Of course, no surveillance or anything like that back in the day, so... Uh, they could only go on the clues that they found at the scene. And of course, they knew he had been working at the gas station um, the night previously. So that was on the 1st of December. 
Christmas came and went without Robert's murder being solved. In January of 1958, January 21st to be exact, Charlie uh, showed up at Carol Ann's home looking for her. Her parents, Velda and Marion, argued with him and said that he was to stay away from their house as well as Carol Ann. Uh, they didn't want him anywhere around her. Charlie left and he called Marion's work, pretending to be him, and said that he wasn't feeling well and that he would be off work for a few days. Charlie then returned to Carol Ann's house where he shot and killed each of her parents. And unfortunately, he also strangled and then stabbed who her two-year-old um, baby sister. Carol Ann later claimed that she came home from school to find Charlie in her home with a shotgun and that he told her her family were being held hostage by a gang of his friends and that they would stay safe as long as she did exactly what he wanted. So they stayed in her house for the next six days, believe it or not. Um, they turned away any visitors to the home, which started to make some of her relatives suspicious. Uh, Carol Ann's grandmother was one of these relatives and she thought that their behavior was extremely odd. So she's the one who actually contacted police. When the police arrived at the home to do a well-being check on January 27th, they found the home completely empty. Carol Ann and Charlie had left but the police made the gruesome discovery of the bodies of uh, Carol Ann's family in one of the outbuildings on the property. Oops, I suppose I knit those last four. Alrighty. So the police get to the home. They find the bodies of Carol Ann's deceased, deceased family and Carol Ann and Charlie are nowhere to be found. So Charlie was now responsible for the deaths of four people, but the couple's crime spree was only just beginning. They fled across the state of Nebraska, whoops, I just hit the camera. So they fled across the state of Nebraska, heading into Wyoming. And this was a trip that would see seven more people die. So they first drove to the farmhouse of um, 70 year old August Mayer or Meyer. He was a friend of Carol Ann's family in Bennett, Nebraska. That's where he lived. August was killed with a single gunshot blast to the head and Charlie also killed August's dog. He and Carol Ann then fled the area, but they drove their car into deep mud, getting it stuck. 
So that's when they decided to abandon their car. As they were walking along the road, a local teenage couple stopped to offer them a ride. This would be a decision that would soon cost them their lives. Robert Jensen and Carol, uh, Carol King picked up the pair and once they were in the car, Charlie forced them to drive back toward an old abandoned storm cellar um, that he was aware of. Once they got there, Charlie forced the couple out of the car and inside the storm shelter. He shot Jensen six times in the head and attempted to rape Carol, but he was unable to do so. He then became angry and shot her as well as stabbed her several, several times. Later, after they were captured, um, Charlie claimed that although he did shoot Jensen, it was actually Carol Ann that killed um, King. Carol Ann, however, um, she had offered a couple of different accounts to what happened um, to the teenage couple. She once stated that she was in the car the entire time. And then at another point, she later admitted that she um, had been holding the gun at uh, Charlie's request, but that uh, she denied having shot anybody. Okay. So far, so good. Pearl back on this side. Once I get my needles untangled. <laughs> so after they had um, made away with the teenage couple, they then stole Robert Jensen's car and drove to a wealthier section of Lincoln, Nebraska. There, they broke into the home of industrialist C. Lauer Ward and his wife, Clara. Their maid, Lillian uh, Fenkel, I believe that's how she pronounced her name, was at home at the time, and Charlie stabbed her multiple times along with the family dog. The couple then waited inside the house for Lauer and Clara to return home. Clara returned first and she was quickly stabbed to death. When Lauer returned a little while later, he was shot. Carol Ann and Charlie then filled the ward's car with jewelry and valuables from their home, and they fled Nebraska, um, continuing on their way to Wyoming. So once the authorities were alerted to the deaths at the ward home, police officers began canvassing the entire area, doing a door-to-door -door search. After several reported sightings of Carol Ann and Charlie, the Lincoln Police Department were accused of being incompetent when they were not captured. Now, realizing that they were driving a fairly recognizable high profile car, uh, the couple decided that they would switch vehicles. 
it was at this point that they came across Merrill Collison sleeping in his Buick along the side of the highway just outside of Douglas, Wyoming. Charlie woke Collison and then shot him dead. He and Carol Ann tried to take Collison's car, but it was equipped with a new device that Charlie was not familiar with, a push pedal emergency brake. So yeah, cars didn't always have emergency brakes on them. And it wasn't something that Charlie was familiar with. So when he tried to put the car in drive to move it, um, it, it wouldn't go anywhere. He was having problems with it. So um, when he, because when Collison had got asleep, I guess what he did was he had engaged the parking brake. And while, so while he was sleeping, the car wouldn't roll or move at all. And without realizing this, um, Charlie ended up stalling the car as he tried to drive it away. So the car stalled and as he was trying to restart the car, a passing motorist named Joe Sprinkle stopped to offer his assistance. He merely thought that um, he had come across a couple people stranded on the side of the highway. Charlie threatened him with a gun and then the two of them got into an altercation. It was at this point that a police car came up on the scene. When Deputy William Romer pulled over, Carol Ann Fugate ran toward him yelling, it's stark weather, he's going to kill me. According to his, uh, I guess his report. It was at this point that Charlie jumped into Joe's car and sped off, pursued by three officers, exceeding speeds of 160 kilometers per hour, which is fairly impressive. I mean, 160 kilometers an hour on today's roads with today's cars, it's super fast, but it's certainly doable. But back then in 1958, with these older model cars, like that was extreme high speed, right? So Sheriff Earl Heflin fired at Charlie and the bullet shattered the car's window. Flying glass cut Charlie's ear deeply and he thought he had actually been shot. Wounded and bleeding, he finally pulled over and at that point was apprehended. So the crime spree that lasted 60 days from his first killing on December 1st, 1957, until the day he was apprehended, January 29th, 1958, was finally over. During interviews, Carol Ann, who was now 14, claimed that she was just a terrified teenager, that she had been held hostage and did not know her family had been killed. She told police that Charlie had abducted her from her home under threat that her family would be harmed if she did not go along with him. Immediately following her arrest, media reports were very sympathetic and even flattering toward her. But as interest in the trial increased, media reports began to change painting Carol Ann as emotionless. They believed that she was actually a willing participant in the crime spree. Okay, now I'm at the end of this row. So I have to check and see how many I've done because I um, need to know how many before I start the color work.
All right, so I counted my rows and I've got the uh, right amount of rows on here now. And I'm gonna start adding in the black, uh, which is for the bottom band along the sweater. <clears throat> so I have to start with that color and we'll continue on with our story here. So I'm just gonna hold this yarn in this hand for a moment. Bear with me here. And I have to start with the black yarn. Here we go. So we'll put two, two black stitches in and then I'll follow with the remaining color here. I just want to get this started. And I'm actually going to switch hands. That's better. Alrighty. So I need to do just counting here. Ten. And I'll just catch my black as I'm going across. Can't see it through the front really, but um, it's so I don't have a big loop dragging across the back. Okay. So Charlie first told police that Carol Ann was not involved and that he had done all the killing himself. He then changed his story and said that Carol Ann was present um, when her family was killed and that it was Carol Ann who had killed the King girl, that was Carol King, as well as um, Clara Ward. He said after her family's death, they had stayed in the home for several days, watching TV and having sex. They were both charged with murder and put on trial. Carol Ann confessed on her own behalf, sorry, Carol Ann testified on her own behalf, but it actually did more damage than good. On the stand, she was confused. Uh, she had lapses in her memory. She also came across at the time as um, sometimes as being very aggressive. And Charlie... Uh, was the prosecution's star witness. Uh, as there were no real witnesses to the crimes, and when they put Charlie on the stand, he just, you know, gave his version of the story. So Carol did admit to holding the gun on the young high school couple, Robert Jensen and Carol King, but she denied killing anyone. Uh, she was found at trial though, to be a willing accomplice and she was found guilty. The trial judge, Harry Spencer, did not believe that Carol Ann was innocent. He believed that she had ample opportunities to flee from Charles, but she didn't. And because of that, she became the youngest female in the United States to be tried for first degree murder. And when she was found guilty, she was given a life sentence. Carol Ann over the years was considered to be a model prisoner. After, eventually after 17 years, she was paroled um, in 1976 
and that was due to a Supreme Court ruling that life imprisonment for minors is unconstitutional. After parole, she went on to live in the Lansing, Michigan area. She worked as a janitorial assistant and in 2007 married a machinist named Frederick Clare. In 2013, Carol Ann was involved in a serious car accident. She was injured, but her husband Frederick, he died at the, at the scene. Carol Ann still maintains her innocence to this day. And there was a book that was actually written by attorney John Stevens Barry about the crimes and Carol Ann's involvement. And he named the book The Twelfth Victim. Carol Ann even applied for a pardon in February of 2020, with her application being supported by relatives of several of the murder victims, but her pardon was denied. Charles Starkweather, on the other hand, was tried and convicted of first-degree murder for the death of Robert Jensen. This was the only murder that he was tried for. Um... He was found guilty and sentenced to death. He was executed in the electric chair on June the 25th, 1959. This was the last execution in Nebraska until 1980, sorry, 1994. The crime spree has been studied by criminal, criminologists and psychologists trying to better understand spree killers and what motivates them, as well as any precipitating factors. And that's the end of our story for this week. Um, I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, Carol Ann, like I said, she's um, free, living her own life now. She did get paroled. Uh, she was denied that pardon, basically on the premise that a pardon um, is not to absolve someone of their sins, and she was already uh, freed from prison in 1976. So thank you again for joining me for this week's episode of Coffee, Crime, and Crafts. I hope you managed to get some work done on your own craft today. As you can see, I got the uh, lower portion of the sweater done, and I've gotten one work row uh, with the color work started. If you enjoyed the episode, please feel free to give it a like and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss up on miss out, sorry, on any upcoming content. I typically upload coffee, crime, and craft videos every couple of weeks, and I'll continue to post regular floss tube videos with updates of my various crafts every few weeks in between. If you'd like to help support my channel and the time it takes to research and prepare each episode, feel free to check out the Buy Me a Coffee link that I'll include in the description box below. A coffee is certainly always appreciated. Until next time, stay safe and happy crafting. Um.